The Super Mario series can easily be split into two groups, 2D and 3D. However, there's a more interesting way of dividing them that can also allow them to be grouped with other games. Basically, this means that I found a way to talk about Dark Souls again. Dark Souls has a lot of options and decisions to make while you play, but the majority of these are done outside of combat. When you're already in a fight, you should have already decided what weapon to use, whether you're going with a shield or rolling, whether you're using magic, how you level your stats, and the list goes on and on. The fighting itself, on the player's end, is a mix of positioning, knowing when it's safe to attack, when to block or dodge, and whether to use a light or strong attack with your weapon, or what spells to use. This is simplifying the combat in Dark Souls so we don't spend more than a few minutes speaking about it. The fastest way to make this point is to jump over to Neo and show the difference between the focus these games have. Neo is a lot like Dark Souls. It has all of those build, weapon, and leveling decisions. In fact, it has more of them. It even has magic and range weapons that can change fights significantly. The key difference is that Neo also achieves a lot of complexity after fighting has started. There are multiple stances, combo moves, special attacks that require the correct button inputs, a Gears of War style stamina regeneration minigame that is also incorporated in another way during combat. The game also expects you to use block and dodges together, it even has different types of dodges. You can parry, the direction of your attacks also matters, and I could probably keep going for another couple of sentences. Again, I'm simplifying some of this stuff, but I think you get the point. Does this mean that Neo is an outright better game than Dark Souls? No, because Dark Souls puts much more attention on things outside of the player's moveset and decisions in combat. There's a lot more enemy variety, things to learn and recognize on that side of the battle instead of on your end. Going through levels is also more involved. There's more variety here as well, and effort went into matching the enemies in each level with the atmosphere and tone that they were meant to convey. This isn't to say that Neo never does this, and I'm also not saying that Dark Souls combat isn't satisfying. The games are very similar. With this shift of focus from the player's actions in Neo to something more simple so it could be more about the enemies and levels in Dark Souls is important to understand. But what the hell does this have to do with Mario? Well, that's because Mario is Dark Souls now. Yahoo! No, I'm kidding. It's because the Mario games can be divided in this exact same way. Look at Mario Brothers on the NES. You can run left, right, and jump. You can get a mushroom to grow larger and survive a hit. There's a fire flower you can get for even more power. And that's it, really. Now let's look at Odyssey. Run in all directions, jump, double jump, triple jump, long jump, duck, roll, throw hat, jump on hat, ground pound, backflip, somersault, wall slide, wall jump. Does this mean that Odyssey is an outright better game than the original Mario? Or does it mean that it's an unfair comparison because we're looking at a very old 2D game next to a newly released 3D one more than 30 years later? Super Mario World has a similar low level of options. Yoshi's Island, which came out on the same console a few years later, is more like Odyssey. Yoshi has way more moves on top of a simple run and jump. An air hover, the ability to turn enemies into eggs and then throw them with an aiming mechanic, a ground pound, and we can once again keep going. For 3D Marios, we have to compare the newer ones to the older ones. Mario's moveset has more options in Mario 64 and Sunshine when compared to Galaxy and 3D World. But those later games have much more involved level design. You're being shot through obstacle courses of challenges that are building on things that are introduced earlier in the levels. 64 and Sunshine do have platforming challenges, but most of the game is about the freedom you have exploring open worlds with a wider moveset. Super Mario Odyssey was intended to be a successor to this type of 3D Mario. Nintendo was very clear about that. And it follows this trend of having open, non-linear levels with more moves on Mario to play with. Having played through Odyssey twice now, I don't think Nintendo was entirely successful with their intentions. Odyssey has more in common with Galaxy and 3D World than I was expecting. But for now, let's continue speaking about how Mario controls. My first run through Odyssey was a great example of someone playing a game wrong, or at least not in the best way. 
Having spent so much time with Mario 64 as a kid, I proceeded to play Odyssey like it was more of that, because that's what I was expecting after Nintendo announced that it was the successor in that line of games. I tried to do a lot of backflips, long jumps, and wall jumps. I also didn't play all that creatively with Mario's new hat moves to break the sequence on jumping challenges, because I recently played 3D World for the first time. That game, more than any other 3D Mario, has you grounded so you go through levels close to what the designers intended. There are some tricks you can use, especially with the cat power up, but if you've played 3D World, I think you know what I'm saying. You're railroaded a lot when you go through all the levels in that game. My second run of Odyssey was more about skipping over as much of it as I could in order to find the fun, so as many hat jumps and dives as possible, trying to stay in the air as long as I could and to get about as fast as I could. This combined with going back and playing through all of the 3D Marios again for this video made me realize that Odyssey has the best movement system out of all of these games. Originally I was going with Galaxy at the top, but now I know I was giving it more credit because of how gravity is used in that game. Although that's a big positive, that's separate from Mario's controls in my opinion and is on the environment level side of that game. 64 and Sunshine still control well all these years later, but there are important refinements in Odyssey that fix long-standing issues, perhaps entirely solved by the game's camera, which I've also come to think of as the best camera in any Mario game, maybe in any 3D third-person game, period. I can only think of one time that it ever made it difficult to see what was happening, and even then it wasn't close to some of the awkward shifting bullshit that can occur in 64 and Sunshine. I can't tell how much of this is the result of a ton of time adding scripted transitions to the camera all over the levels, especially parts of Metro City when you enter tight alleyways, or if it's the result of allowing the camera to freely move through physical objects and a mix of transparency and dithering on Mario. Maybe it's just that Nintendo finally released themselves from the lack of you with a camera limitation. Either way, with camera problems still plaguing some games today, this might be the game's biggest achievement. Galaxy and 3D World also didn't have many camera problems, but they cheat by having unusual or forced perspectives. Galaxy is built around small planetoids, or shaped objects that have artificial, impossible gravity. The camera has much more freedom because of this, and even if you do get away from it, there aren't many pits to fall into for some harsh punishment when you can't see properly. When there are, the linearity of the game can allow for the same force perspective help that 3D World uses. You can still change some of the angles there, but not like you can in 64, Sunshine, and Odyssey. Going back to controls, the only issues I have with Odyssey are the nerfed long jump, wall jump, and somersault. The long jump feels like a lot lower of a boost to momentum than it was in 64 and Galaxy, and you'll get more out of rolling around like Sonic instead, or chaining jumps together. Likewise, I don't understand why you can't long jump into a wall kick anymore like you could in 64, especially since it required precise timing to pull off. I've been wondering if it was some sort of limitation with breaking the intended path through levels, but the cappy moves allow for far more than what a long jump into a wall kick could do. So that can't be the answer unless it's some leftover design consideration that wasn't reverted after the cap made it so you could break through levels. The wall jump has also been on the decline of each game, becoming gradually useless. Compare how it looks in 64 and Sunshine to the later games, and now this pathetic version of Odyssey. The reduced distance would be tolerable if it wasn't also a lot slower to execute. As with the long jump, I don't understand this change, and it made parts of the game very frustrating. I really never wanted to use the wall jump because of this. The problem I have with the somersault is more of a nitpick than anything. It was quicker to pull off in the other games than could be more reliably done from a resting position. Odyssey must require more momentum or have other inputs that can trigger from what the somersault requires. Ultimately, this may actually be a positive, since Mario controls so smoothly in Odyssey that this change may be a result of tweaks to basic on-the-ground movement. It still threw me off a bit though, and I miss being able to do the somersault so easily. The cappy moves, when combined with the ground pound and dive, are where the game shines the most though. 3D Mario games have always had good movement, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have a lot of depth or complexity within those systems. 
What I mean by that is that while it is fun to move Mario, that doesn't always translate to a lot of options and decisions while doing so. To return to our comparisons and examples from earlier, 3D World and Galaxy have the weakest movement in my opinion, but have the best gameplay because of the ways the game builds its challenges and levels around it. Let's look at Mario Sunshine for a better example. A favorite for many players are the levels where you lose your water jetpack and have to get through an obstacle course with just Mario. Despite Mario having by far the weakest moveset and lowest amount of options during these sequences, the challenge and variety introduced by the progression on the platforming make it enjoyable for many people. I view Galaxy 1 and 2 as this concept stretched over most of an entire game. In 64, these would be the Bowser Assault courses before the boss fights, which were some of my favorite sections in 64 when I played it as a kid. What I've noticed as a trend while replaying these games is an effort on Nintendo's part to make Mario interesting in some way while in the air. 64 has a basic dive, Sunshine has the hover mode on the jetpack, Galaxy has a motion control spin that allows you to stop falling for a moment, it and 3D World also have power-ups that add more options after you've jumped. Odyssey has the best version of this idea. Kathy feels far more natural to use than Flood and is more smoothly incorporated into other moves, especially when you fit into the theme of Mario being a character that jumps a lot. There's a combo string of moves that you will learn while playing Odyssey that goes like this. Jump, hat throw, dive, bounce off the hat, throw the hat again, repeat dive, and then land. This can be used to gain more distance either vertically or horizontally. It also has a variant that can be used to climb walls that starts with a ground pound into a high jump, then a hat throw, dive, and bounce, then wall kicking and doing it again from the height. There's also a bonus if you jump while catching your hat. On the ground this is a higher jump, and in the air it allows you to stop falling for an instant. Little things like this tend to go a long way for me enjoying a game, and I really appreciate them. Something I feel strongly about here is how much better the hat throw is than the flood hover and the galaxy twirl. Sunshine wrecks so much of its platforming challenges by having an autocorrect water jetpack cannon thing with a generous amount of time before running out. You rarely have to aim any jump when you have flood, which is almost always. Galaxy did this far better with a twirl that allows you quick correction if you're only a little bit off the platform or miss a jump. This is sort of like the rewind mechanic in Sands of Time, something quick and easy to use if you misjudge a jump a little, something that's easy to do in a 3D space compared to 2D. Odyssey's hat throw fulfills this function just as well as the Galaxy Twirl, but doesn't require any motion control bullshit. This is a huge improvement for me, even if there are still some motion controls in Odyssey and other parts of it. Some hat throws can only be triggered with motion controls, but they're thankfully not required much. I do wish that Nintendo would give the guy who keeps pushing them his own containment series or something, because seriously, fuck everything about them. Especially if you try to play this game in handheld mode, it just doesn't work unless you undock the Joy-Cons, which is just really awkward. I, I don't understand how that's acceptable. Aside from that though, you're probably thinking that this all sounds great. Mario games are known for their movement. If Odyssey has the best system and the best camera, surely it must be amazing. So why did I say I was so disappointed at the beginning? Because of the other half of the comparisons that we keep coming back to. Odyssey does have fantastic movement, but it doesn't do anything with it. It would be like having Chris Pratt as your online boyfriend. It would be great, and you could rightfully brag, but you're not really getting the most out of that relationship, aren't you? You're not really getting what you get. There's also the problem that while the hat throw combo is fun to pull off, it's a one-trick pony. There's nothing else you can do with it. That sequence of events, jump, throw, dive, bounce, throw, is what you'll be doing again and again. Whether you do the full combo or only be part of it, every jump that isn't a normal jump in Odyssey will be right there. For a game that only uses three buttons on the gamepad, only two of them face buttons, that's a missed opportunity for some more options. Even Super Mario World has a second type of jump with its own dedicated button. For me, this is Odyssey's fatal problem that made most of my time with it a huge chore, even when I was going out of my way to try to break out of sequence and be creative with getting around, trying really hard to find the fun. There's very little that's interesting to do, an immense amount of filler and recycled content, and a lack of worthwhile things to see. 
Aside from this improvement on movement, the game falls short and is worse than every other 3D Mario out there, except for maybe Sunshine, the game it has the most in common with. So I foresee that there will be some strong reactions to what I just said, and I'd like to go through some of them to support my points. The first is that some of you might think that asking for both is too much. The previous Mario games we went through have all been split, right? The games that have the simpler movesets go for challenges and levels instead. The games with wider movesets have simpler levels. There's a balance that each is striking. Well, Yoshi's Island has both. This is the best Mario game for me, and it's probably for this exact reason. Yoshi's Island has so many options while moving, jumping, hovering, eating, and throwing. It even has options within those options, and matches this with constant and continual exploration of new levels, themes, obstacles, enemies, and even power-ups. The way that Cat Possession and Odyssey changes your entire moveset, Yoshi's Island did that first, even down to the weird shift in the types of vehicles. It wasn't all that successful with the idea, but then neither was Odyssey in my opinion. This is why the Galaxy games are my favorite in the 3D Marios, because while the moveset is on the simpler side, it's not insultingly low. But it's important to acknowledge that this criticism I'm laying on Odyssey isn't unique just to that game. All of the 3D Marios could have benefited from either expanded movement options, or more interesting levels, or both. I also realize that I haven't gone into great detail yet on how exactly Odyssey is lacking in this department. Most of the video will be spent addressing that primarily on the power moon objective side of things, but right now there's another way that the game feels to be interesting that's also linked to a counter-argument that I think many people will have. That the game isn't meant to have involved platforming challenges, because it's more about exploration and discovery like 64 and Sunshine. Well, first of all, 64 and Sunshine did have a decent amount of platforming. It's also important to understand that 64 was the first jump the series took from 2D to 3D. Audiences weren't used to that yet, and judging from the sorry state of the camera in that game, having complicated platforming wouldn't have been a good thing. Think of how much of the precision jumping in 64 is on large platforms with the challenge being linked to how they're moving or being covered in lava, instead of sticking tight landings on smaller platforms like in the 2D games. Sunshine also builds platforming challenges in its open levels and is rarely about exploration either, because you're kicked out of the level after achieving each goal, a new set of obstacles could be loaded in when you go in for the next star. Levels could and were altered to become wide open platforming tasks instead of staying mostly the same like they do in Odyssey. But even if we ignore all that, or assume that I'm wrong, Odyssey has boring world designs and unsatisfying exploration. It actually blows my mind that the names of each kingdom in Odyssey wear how plain they are on their sleeves. There are 17 kingdoms in Odyssey, and look at them. The Sand Kingdom, Snow, Lake, Seaside, Cloud, Wooded. The most interesting names are Metro, Moon, Ruined, Luncheon, and Bowser's. The last one because Bowser's Kingdom could pretty much be anything with a name like that. But most of these have themes that we've seen many times before, and in the few cases that we haven't, are really mundane. The three that interested me the most were the Cap Kingdom, Ruin Kingdom, and Luncheon Kingdom. The first two were barely developed, to the point that Ruin Kingdom feels like cut content and Luncheon being my favorite world, but it's the best of a bad lot. There are many things that I don't fully understand here, or that I don't fully agree with or comprehend. First up is that Mario 64 was the first attempt at a 3D Mario, and yet it has far more creative world design than Odyssey. I'll go further with this and say, if they couldn't think of anything new and just decided to rehash desert, forest, seaside, snow, and water themes, why didn't they remake the most interesting ideas from 64 instead? Have another wet-dry world, with the really compelling idea of a water level being linked to the painting's entrance, and changing what parts of it you can access. Have another clock level, with an expanded scope on new hardware. Rainbow Riot is something else that could have been really cool on a larger scale. And speaking of larger scales, why not do the big small world idea a second time? That was really cool in 64. And I know this all might not sound great because it's reusing ideas, but the game did that already and went with the most boring, bland worlds instead of the interesting ones. 
Secondly, for a game that's supposedly all about exploration, a lot of these levels don't have you doing any of that. I mentioned that Ruin Kingdom feels like cut content. If you haven't played it, this world only has a handful of power moons to collect. This is mainly a boss arena that, for some bizarre reason, becomes a world you can visit and revisit even though what you're seeing on the screen right now is the entire world. Same for the Cloud Kingdom, you fight Bowser here, and you're allowed to come back for a pittance of moons compared to the other levels. To me, this is blatantly padding out the world list so the game looks larger than it really is, but maybe I'm just being too cynical. Of the remaining kingdoms, the three moon worlds, all of which look visually similar, have very little exploration. The first one has the most, but it's quite bare compared to the other worlds, which admittedly makes sense because it's on the moon, but still, it's the moon, maybe you could have done something more creative with it. Dark Side and Darker Side are hubs for challenge rooms and boss fights. They have nothing else and nothing to explore. Even saying their names is boring. Bowser's Kingdom is a series of chunks connected by an electrical wire that Mario can ride, meaning that this is exactly like a level from Mario Galaxy with a bunch of extra moons slash stars to hunt down in every nook and cranny. It doesn't even fit with this wide open exploration scene at all. The remaining 11 worlds all function like the castle from Mario 64. There are hubs that you explore and look for doors and pipes and entrances to separate challenge areas. Just like the paintings and entrances to the slide room and red coin swimming chamber in 64. But even here there's a wild amount of variance in quality, quantity, and opportunity for exploration. Cap Kingdom, Cascade Kingdom, Snow Kingdom, Lost Kingdom, and Lake Kingdom are all tiny. Their names are bigger than they are. While they're all a decent size when you include interior sections of the challenge rooms, they're not much bigger than some of the worlds in 64 when you're wandering around outside of them. Despite this, they still have dozens of moons crammed all over the place. It's stunning to me that a game that's meant to be about exploration has worlds that are this small. The final six feel like the only proper kingdoms in the game. Mushroom, Sand, Wooded, Metro, Seaside, and Luncheon. There is some exploration to do in these worlds, but aside from the Mushroom Kingdom, you are first sent through a linear set of objectives just like a galaxy level in order to unlock the full freedom to collect everything in the level. This is something I haven't seen many people acknowledge, probably because most people simply follow that linear path before they properly hunt through each level. A lot of criticism has been laid against the previous 3D Marios for kicking you out of worlds after you hit the star, and it's probably well-deserved criticism, I think. While Odyssey does not do this, the levels still do go through stages and reset, and expect you to watch video sequences showing your next objective. You can't progress to some areas without doing earlier moons first, and in most cases, Entire worlds will go through two or three checkpoint moments before most of the moons and challenges spawn at all. These checkpoint moments send you back to the beginning and make you go through some loading, just like you were spat out of the painting. Luncheon Kingdom shows this best with you having to journey your way all the way to the bowl of stew on top of the volcano, get blown off by the boss, and then go all the way back there again through an alternative method. Wooded Kingdom and Sand Kingdom do this exact thing too, with kicking you back to the start. After doing this two times, only then will all of the first stage moons and challenges fully unlock. Then, after beating the game, just the same as every world, you have to come back to break open a moon cube to get the final set of moons and challenge rooms to spawn. In this way, you are actually punished for any exploration you do before beating the game the first time. To be clear, this isn't a case of some moons or doors being phased out so you can see them but not interact with them yet. This is stuff simply not existing until you've reached a trigger point in the game. So if you explore an entire level when you first arrive, you'll have to explore the whole thing all over again to see what new things appeared after you finished the story moment. The world itself doesn't change, it's that this scarecrow mannequin challenge thing wasn't on this platform before or that this moon floating here wasn't around yet. It's the same level, just do it again, and then again after smashing the moon cube. But even accepting that, you're still always hunting for the same things. Moons, and purple coins, and entrances to challenge rooms. At which point the game becomes nothing about exploration, and turns into 3D world with challenge levels instead. The trend I kept noticing while playing, to the point that it began to be really great on my nerves, 
was how much the exploration involved looking over edges of platforms to see hidden ledges or coins hanging just out of sight. I don't know who enjoys doing this sort of thing over and over and over again, but it's certainly not me. Even in these six larger worlds, exploration always felt constrained by the edges of the map, and that there was hardly anything to find that felt worth the effort, especially after playing quite possibly the best exploration-based gameplay ever earlier in the year with Breath of the Wild. It's a shame that Odyssey hints at some cool stuff early on when you use the possession of a T-Rex in Cascade Kingdom to reveal a hidden path on the cliff face. You're causing some significant change in the level that feels unscripted and immediate. This never really happens again. The changes are tied to linear story progression instead, and none of them were as cool as this one was. Having brought up the possessions now, it's best to dive right into how they work. They're not the weakest part of Odyssey, but they're not the strongest either. I think some people don't realize that possessions are simply a different version of power-ups that have been present in the series since the beginning. From the Fire Flower to the Tanuki Suit, the Winged Cap, Water Nozzles, the suit, cannon block, and now possessions. The method you acquire them is different, but the idea is still the same. Even if that wasn't the case, or you view them as different, we already went back to see how Yoshi's Island did it before. So did Banjo-Kazooie with the mumbo-jumbo transformations. There was also an entire game built out of this concept of body possessions called Space Station Silicon Valley that released on the 64 the major difference that I think most people hone in on is that power-ups in Odyssey are a replacement instead of an enhancement. This is what makes them visually interesting, but also prevents them from being a mechanic that I can fully enjoy. Let's rewind and go through that list again. From the beginning, power-ups in Mario have typically been an addition gained on top of Mario's standard moveset. This can be a new move or a buff. The Fire Flower allows you to shoot fireballs. The Power Star grants you invisibility. Nothing else has changed. You can still run and jump and move like always. The Feather in Super Mario World is just like this. It grants you the ability to fly, glide, twirl attack, and also control your rate of fall by releasing the jump button. It's a great power-up that purely increases your options. Nothing is taken away from you. The caps in Mario 64 are the same, enhancements, not replacements. It's sunshine where things first change with the nozzle upgrades. These give you a new function at the cost of losing another nozzle. Not only does this make them feel more narrow and restricted in use, it makes them a hassle to find, switch to, and then switch back when you're done. You can also never mix their abilities together. I don't think I really need to go through any others, but I'd still like to point out two more. Spring Mario and Galaxy being on the replacement side. I think you can even imagine Captain possessing a spring monster with his eyes sitting on top and you can see it's the same thing there, it's just a possession. And the double cherries in 3D World being an enhancement. It's one of my favorite power-ups in the series because of how much it changes things without a single addition to the moveset. It's also an example of something that couldn't work in an open world. 3D World had to be this 3D version of Super Mario Bros. 3 for this power-up to be possible. Almost all of the power-ups in Odyssey are replacements. On one hand, this can be seen as a strength because it adds some variety. You're not always Mario. Sometimes you're a bullet bill, or a tank, or a bird, or a stretchy onion plant thing you dream of every child. The positives here are that the transitions from Mario to whatever victim you're possessing are as quick as acquiring any power-up in the series. Everything controls well and never felt awkward, likely because each of the possible possessions are very simple. That's the problem, though. The moveset and abilities that replace Mario are never close to interesting or varied. You're a tank that can shoot. You're a fireball that can swim in lava. You're a Goomba that can jump. This comes back to the idea of player options versus the environments and challenges you're put through. This issue of low complexity isn't strictly the fault of the possessions themselves, but rather that Nintendo never did anything worthwhile with them. Even the boss fights that use the possessions are boring until the rematches later. Even then, some of them aren't that engaging. There's a final gauntlet of challenges in the game after you acquire 500 moons. These incorporate many of the enemies you can possess in the game, and even here at the end, the concept isn't taken very far. This should have been about where the game hit in the middle and built even further, not the ultimate challenge of Odyssey. Power-ups could have been enhancements instead of replacements to alleviate the issue, but I think the cat possession was a concept worth exploring. The solutions are obvious to me, which means they must be even more obvious to Nintendo. 
So what I'm about to go through is, in a sense, a waste of time when it comes to providing critical feedback. But it is worthwhile to build to a point that I mentioned earlier, about why the game was so disappointing for me, a longtime fan of the series. Outside of more developed challenges, the two solutions are to either use more buttons on the gamepad so that each possession has more abilities to learn and master, or to make it so that each possession functions like a saved power-up in Super Mario World. You know, when you already have a power-up active and a second one is stored in the blue box at the top of the screen. Captain could store a possession when you're in Mario form so that you can switch quickly between the two for a series of challenges that incorporate both movesets. For a boss, this might require switching back to Mario to do some running and jumping over obstacles before switching back to the possessed enemy for a specific move. For platforming, this could be required for mid-air switches to do some hat bounces as Mario and then switch back to the bird to peck into a wall at the end. Or jumping as a fireball for some height, switching to Mario for a jump, and then switching back to the fireball to land safely in some lava that would have killed Mario otherwise. Remember that there are at least four buttons that aren't used on the controller for this game. That doesn't include pressing down the analog sticks or combining any of them with the ground pound down either. Adding moves isn't the only way to increase complexity to a game as we just saw with Steven Sausage Roll, but it is one of the easier ways that Mario Odyssey could have done it. This is all obvious, which means that there are likely other, more difficult, and better options that can make possessions more enjoyable and interesting that Nintendo likely dismissed that I can't think of. And the reason they would do that is, I think, because I'm not the target audience for this game. Most likely, neither are you. Super Mario Odyssey was made to harvest new fans on its new hit system. With gameplay that's as accessible as possible, with rewards teeming around every corner to create a constant positive feedback loop. With levels that are understandable and a bit creative with its inhabitants, but never too wacky or unique to be off-putting or confusing to newcomers with its setting. With a cool toy figure-like ship and a fun cappy sidekick along for the ride. A visual spectacle is never far away, there's not even a challenge in the endgame. More than any other Mario game, Super Mario Odyssey was made for children. Children that have never played a Mario game. Children with the brand new system that's selling so surprisingly well. Children that will become new fans forever. Viewed like this, the title of this video is false. Super Mario Odyssey is a masterpiece if you're looking at it from developer intentions, if I'm right. The problem for me is that I feel like hardly anyone else sees this. I'm not alone, I've seen more people pointing out Odyssey's flaws than I did for Breath of the Wild, but I definitely feel like I'm in the minority. Reviewers haven't been qualifying their scores with, hey, this is a 10 out of 10 because it's such a great kids game and that was the point. They've been about how they enjoyed it so much that they literally applauded as the credits rolled and how it was a glorious return to their childhood and the best in the series and that Mario has never been better and that they were enjoying it as adults, not adults judging it as a game for children. To be clear, games and movies for children can be great for adults. They can be enjoyed as wholesome entertainment, or they might have some subtle jokes for an older audience. Games can also include options for more complex play or optional content at the end for the audience that's been with them for longer. Most Mario games have done this in the past. Odyssey does not. Its post-credits content is more of the same and barely a step up from what came before. In fact, I'd argue that it's less optional than ever, and if you don't complete it, you're not getting the same amount of value out of Odyssey that you can complete its 3D games. You're only getting half the game when compared to the other titles. There are many ways I can support this conclusion about the game. For instance, how Cappy will continue to read tutorial messages about moves you should have already been using for hours and hours as you move from one world to the next. But the strongest way is to go through how you spend the vast majority of your time with Odyssey, collecting filler power moons that should be boring to most players that have played any Mario game before now, or maybe any game at all. There are 880 moons in Super Mario Odyssey, which can be further boosted to 999 if you want to collect coins to buy moons above the limit. Those are separate from the listed canon moons that you'll also be buying throughout the game. If you'll forgive the indulgence here, I think it's important that I lay a foundation for people who haven't played Odyssey yet, to show them what getting these moons looks like at the beginning of the game, so they understand how bad most of these moons are later on.
Mushroom Kingdom is the first world in Odyssey. It's right there on the leftmost side of the kingdom list at the beginning, and it makes sense that Mario would start out in a relaxing version of Peach's home before getting abducted. It also serves as some heavy, heavy hitting nostalgia for those who have played Mario 64. Since it is the first level, it's understandable that most of the moons here are simple and straightforward. That being said, even here at the start, I think we'll agree that they could have stepped things up a bit. Here are some examples. You get moons for finding some seeds and carrying them back to a pot for them to grow into a moon. There's no special obstacle or enemy that tries to stop you. It's simply find the seed, plant, come back later for the moon. Around here there's also a rabbit that's bouncing around for you to catch for a moon. You can climb to the roof of the castle for a moon that's waiting at the top of a flagpole. Likewise, there's a moon for throwing your hat on the shiny part of a tree here, and another for jumping on top of the shop and speaking to Captain Toad. No other requirement, you just talk to him. There's a timing challenge involving riding a scooter to get a moon before he spawns. This is also the only area in this kingdom that has enemies in it, a group of Goombas. You can possess these Goombas for two different moons, first by scaring a toad away from his garden moon, which you figure out by simply speaking to him, and another by stacking Goombas to reach a Lady Goomba after raining the castle's moat. Pretty simple. This area also has you eating a lot of apples as Yoshi for three different moons, which is really repetitive, but again, it's the starting area. Just like those four moons you got from planting seeds, it's early on so it's forgivable. Same for the moon that you get by leading around the dog to areas where he'll dig. Eventually you'll find the right spot that will spawn a moon instead of coins. It's tedious, but a cute way to get people to adjust to the controls this early on in the game. Just like this moon you get from trying out the cappy hat throwing move on this flower field. There are two moons from doing the same race twice with some friendly Koopa Troopas. There are many of these races in the game, and I think this is the shortest, easiest one since it's the first level. You run from here up to the castle entrance and that's it. The way the game introduces the 2D transitions is also at the same level of accessibility. You follow a straight path while collecting musical notes for your moon. There's a moon for collecting 100 coins to buy at the same store that we saw earlier. There's also a moon for purple coins that unlocks a Mario 64 outfit for you to wear. This grants you access to a room guarded by another toad who says he wants to see the outfit when you speak to him. Inside is a memorization test for the order these chests spawn, and another moon for throwing your hat onto something. This time it's the star in the middle of this room where the Haunted Mansion entrance was in Mario 64. And don't worry, we're almost done now. There's a moon for finding six sheep in the level and herding them back to the pen with hat throws and running at them. It would be ridiculously tedious anywhere else, but again, we're at the start of the game, so this is just practice with the controls. Same for the music toad that teaches you how to play different music tracks by requesting a specific one from you. You get a constellation moon for doing this tutorial, I guess. Inside the castle itself, you get a moon for noticing that a tile is sticking up from the floor and ground pounding it down. This knocks another one up. I think you do a series of 10 or so tiles in a row here for a moon, which is probably teaching you to ground pound or something, or to look out for things and notice them. There's also another nostalgia moon here for looking up at the light like you did in 64 for the winged cap challenge. Unfortunately, Odyssey just gives you a moon for this instead of leading to something to do. Looking at a light in Odyssey is on the same level as this shrine in 64 for some reason. I don't get that one. Finally, there are some challenge rooms around the kingdom. One is a picture match new game which is charming and fun, but not really anything to do with Mario platforming. It's one of many, many mini games in Odyssey. Another shrine has you eating more fruit as Yoshi, so I think that's five moons here that you get from eating fruit. There are a handful more of these challenge rooms, but for now let's move forward from this and show you one of the final levels in the game and make a comparison from how simple the game starts to how complex it is by the end. Which means that it's finally time for me to drop the act and get to the punchline. Mushroom Kingdom isn't the first level in Mario Odyssey. It's actually the second to last one. You get to Mushroom Kingdom after beating the first part of the game and saving Peach, which means you have to do Cap Kingdom, Cascade Kingdom, Sand Kingdom, Wooded, Lake, Cloud, Lost, yes I am saying them all to emphasize this point, Metro, Snow, Seaside, Luncheon, Room, Bowsers, and Moon Kingdom. You have to collect over 120 moons along the way to progress, more than the entirety of stars in Mario 64 all those and the final fight with Bowser before you get to do Mushroom Kingdom with all of those simple beginner tier moons that I just went through. Also, I'm sorry if that was tedious to go through for anyone who's already played the game, but I figure if you have then you're used to the game already and shouldn't be too bothered by it.
Now before anyone accuses me of cherry picking, I want to point out that there are seven other challenges I didn't go through in the Mushroom Kingdom that you can do on your first visit there. These are tougher moves to get, however six of them are rematches against bosses you already fought on your way here. This isn't new content, it's tweaked recycled content that's been made slightly more difficult, raised to the level it should have been the first time through anyway. The other challenge is a really good 2D section that has a moving background that you need to stay in or else you'll be ejected back into 3D and fail the level. It's a cool idea that could have also been used for possessions, some sort of feel that banishes Cappy from possessing an enemy so you have to play around with. This is, in my judgment, the only good area in the entirety of the Mushroom Kingdom that is also new content for this world. I also like the memory minigame, but as I said, that has nothing to do with Mario's moveset. It could function just as well as a browser game or side content in any game, really. Every kingdom in Super Mario Odyssey is like the Mushroom Kingdom, an overwhelming amount of shitty filler moons and only a rare few that are worth your time. Now obviously I can't go through all of them in a video like this, is what I would usually say right about now, but no, we're doing all of them for this video, so buckle up and hold on to your juice box. First up, that tutorial I mentioned with playing music for Toad, you do that five times in five separate kingdoms. That riveting task of leading the dog around to dig in different spots until you finally randomly stumble onto the one that has the moon buried underneath it, you do that five different times too. These are the least offensive ones by the way, we're starting slow and ramping up here. The trend you're going to see is that next to nothing in Odyssey is ever done once. Nothing is pure. Every idea, enemy, and boss is copy and pasted and then copy and pasted again, usually with no changes, so you're always encountering the same version of the same task instead of it being built on in any way. It's just the background that looks different. Remember the seeds we found and carried all the way back to the pots to plant them? You might not fully grasp how much time that takes, and how boring it is to carry them across the entire world to plant them. Do you want to guess how many times Odyssey asks you to do that across the whole game? How about we channel our inner jigsaw and play a game? Pause the video, scroll down to the comment section, and type out, This is my guess for how many plant a seed moons there are in Odyssey. I'll give you a hint, it's more than 5. Okay, all done? All good? Unpause? The answer is 18. There are 18 of these seeds to find throughout all the kingdoms with no challenge other than to waddle your way back to the pots while carrying them. In Luncheon Kingdom, they're golden turnips instead that you need to throw into a cooking pot and then wait for the moon to spawn and fly out before you can go and pick it up and watch the Got a Moon jingle. Which brings us to all the prep work that went into this video. See, this is actually my second video on Super Mario Odyssey. The other one is on my second channel and is all of the You Got a Moon animations strung together to see how much time it takes. The answer to that is 72 minutes if you get all 880 moons. You might think that making that was a waste of time, and you're half right. I was collating all the moons in Adobe Premiere anyway and decided to make the video while doing that. The other criticism people might have is that other games, especially other Mario games, have a lot of wasted time when achieving these too. Mario 64 and Sunshine kick you out of levels, so do the Galaxy games, there are the flagpole celebrations in 3D World, there's a running trend of this stuff in the series. Well, first off, aside from Mario Sunshine, those games only do that at the end of a structured piece of content. You have a goal, you're working your way there, you succeed, here's your celebration, enjoy your star or moon or shine sprite or whatever it is. In Odyssey, these interruptions happen constantly since you're given moons for just about everything. Later on, you're even given moons for getting moons. Yes, you heard that correctly. These moons that are all over the place take you out of the flow of gameplay. 3D World had them too and did not stop the game for a celebration jingle when you picked them up, it only did that at the flagpole at the end of every level. You are free to keep moving and not lose whatever flow of movement or momentum you are currently in. Another way of looking at this is that the celebrations you get in Odyssey for beating bosses or for reaching the end of a challenge room never bothered me. It was the hundreds and hundreds of filler moon celebrations that bogged everything down. 
There's one part way through a challenge room that interrupts gameplay so severely that it has to remove your speed boost flower power up and make you pick up another one after it's over in order to continue the level. The majority of the prep work for this video is cataloging every moon in the game to find out exactly how many of them are a waste of time and or repeated content. As you can see from these categories, there's a ton of repetition. Depressingly enough, only 6 moons out of 880 ended up being put under a miscellaneous jumping group. These were for dumping gauntlets or killing enemies in the world that weren't tied to another type of challenge. There were only 6 in the whole game. Everything else fit under these categories and labels. The most common counter-argument that I've seen in defense of Odyssey's filler moons is that you don't have to do them all, just like you don't have to do all of the Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild. There are 880, and you get to pick and choose which ones. This argument is mostly correct. Just like I said in my Breath of the Wild video, there are so many Korok seeds in the game to cast a wide net so that exploration can be consistently rewarded for observant players. It's side content that you're meant to do only a portion of. There are a few key differences between Odyssey and Breath of the Wild though. First of all, it was funny to realize how much the two games resemble each other. Shrines and Korok seeds are big parts of Zelda. Shrines are doors you find in the world that lead to a separate, instanced area with a challenge and a reward in it. Korok seeds are strewn all over the map and found often if you're hunting for them. Odyssey has challenge rooms that are doors, pipes, and rockets that you find in the worlds that lead to a separate, instanced area with a challenge and a reward in it. Filler moons are strewn all over the map and found often if you're hunting for them. The challenge rooms also have the same problem with a lack of complexity when it comes to exploring their ideas, but we'll get to that later on. However, despite these similarities, it's easy to see that Breath of the Wild has a lot more going on. It has a lot more involved combat, loot and equipment, crafting and cooking, a much larger play area in its overworld, a climbing and gliding mechanic, special powers that are, to me, way more interesting, and it spends a lot of time on its story. If Korok seeds are side content, this is what the place to the side of. Mario Odyssey has none of these things. Finding moons is the main objective, and most of them are on the same level as these Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild. If anything is side content, it's the purple coins placed in each kingdom that really could function just the same as any other moon hiding spot if Nintendo had decided to switch places with them. There are tons of moons sitting out in the open just like these coins are. Way more than you might think. Now you could argue that the moons are just there as a carrot dangled to have the player perform acrobatic feats with Mario's controls, just like the objectives in Breath of the Wild are there to push you toward fighting and exploring with Link, but that's a poor way of excusing that this is all there is to do in Odyssey. All side quests are for moons, all main quests are for moons, all exploration leads to moons, all shrines lead to moons. Everything leads to moons, most of which barely require any in-depth usage of Mario's movement. Just imagine if everything in Breath of the Wild led to a Korok seed. Still, it wouldn't be fair to say that you have to collect all 880 of these moons, just like I'd say finding 70 to 100 stars in Mario 64 is enough to be done, and finding the same amount of shrines in Breath of the Wild is enough to be done. For Odyssey, I think this number sits at 500 moons. It's a lot higher because the maximum is also a lot higher. Relatively, however, it's about the same as these other examples. Plus, it makes a lot of sense when you see the ending after acquiring 500 moons. It brings the game back around to where Mario and Kathy started, with them possessing another frog, the first thing they ever possessed at the beginning, and reflecting on the long journey that they've taken together. There are still 380 moons to find after this, but this is enough to be considered done. I still went and got all 880, but that's my own decision and I won't hold it against the game. I mostly did it for research anyway, to determine whether there are even enough worthwhile moons to get to 500. Turns out it's nowhere close, and you're constantly going to dip into these filler Korok seed moons. That's the other counter-argument I see brought out a lot. If you don't like the filler moons, just don't do them. There are a few problems with this argument, even if it may sound reasonable at first. For starters, let's make it absolutely clear that there aren't even 500 good moons in Odyssey, even if you could magically only do those ones. 
If you combine every moon you get from fighting bosses, doing challenge rooms, and every mini game, you would still be more than 200 short from this 500 moon goal. And that's being overly generous because not all of those moons are worth your time. Many of them are the same content used again and again and are Korok seed tier instead of actually good worthwhile moons. Secondly, there's no way to know ahead of time whether something is worth your time or something you should avoid until you go and do it. Not every door leads to a challenge room, some just lead to a chest sitting there that you open and get a full moon. You can't tell how good a mannequin timer challenge is going to be until you throw your hat on it and find out. Most of them are bad, but you can't know until you try, and once you're trying, you're already there and you should probably finish. Same goes for speaking to NPCs for moons. Will they have tasks or will they just give you a moon? If they do have a request, will it be interesting or not? While it would be very helpful if Nintendo put all the bad moons on a list and read for us to avoid, I think that would do more harm than good for the game's image and they wouldn't be willing to do it. Also think about what that argument is really saying. You could have had fun with Odyssey if you avoided 80% of its content and only did the good stuff. It's ridiculous. Lastly, there are also moons that are so easy to get that you would be wasting more time if you didn't pick them up. Remember, on your first time through, you have no idea how long the game will be or how many moons you'll need by the end. The game has made it very clear that they're important. They're the reward for everything after all, so why not grab that moon you see sitting on a pile of salt, or hanging on top of that archway, or in this hole, or hovering on this cliff, or stuck to this wall, or floating on top of this rotating platform. These are some of the strangest moons in the game. They're just sitting there, no challenge, no task, just a moon floating waiting for you to get it. Should we play the guessing game again? Pause the video and scroll down to type out your guess. I think there are X many moons in Odyssey that are sitting in the world waiting for you to pick them up. Your hint this time is that it's more than 50. All done? Here we go. 102. Almost as many stars in the entire game of Mario 64. Almost one eighth of all of the moons in Odyssey. They're just floating there waiting for you to pick them up. But the worst ones of all are the NPC moons. These are the same category that hold the play a song for Toad moons. Those ones actually require more effort than most in this category. Do you know how in Mario 3D World, Captain Toad has his own set of unique levels with perspective-based challenges and no jump button to offer some variety in gameplay? Well, in Odyssey, Captain Toad is just an NPC you find somewhere in the level who gives you a moon for free just for speaking to him. He was never hard to find either since the game is all about wandering around looking for stuff. You just stumble across him, here's your free moon. Other NPC moons include a quest line that starts with a taxi in the sand kingdom. These two guys are visiting most of the other worlds in a certain order that you follow by speaking to them in each kingdom. They're usually right next to the Odyssey ship after you arrive. Talk to them, get a moon, that's it. After beating the game, Princess Peach can be found in every kingdom for a free moon. She is also never in a difficult place to find. Talk to her, get another free moon. 115 moons are acquired via this method, just talking to NPCs. Unfortunately, we have to linger on these ones for a bit because some of the worst moons in the game are in this category. For some missed potential, we have the research ghost that wants you to bring a possessed enemy for inspection. These could have shaken things up by making it difficult to reach the goal while in possessed form, but instead it's just a simple matter of finding the enemy and waddling over with no obstacles whatsoever. It's more seed and pot planting to your bullshit. Think of how this issue is already addressed and solved in earlier Mario games. And I mean early. Mario 2 and 3 on the NES. When you steal a key in Mario 2 and those floating mask things begin to chase you, or the evil sun appearing in the desert level to harass you while you try to get forward, there's none of this in Odyssey. Two of the first games in the series did this better. These NPC moons are also inexplicably tied to the main questline in Metro Kingdom when Pauline asks you to find some musicians. Four of them. Only one of these could possibly be considered hidden, and even that's being generous since you'll be exploring the tops of the buildings anyway. 
This world has more of a focus on scaling vertically than any other. For some insane reason, each of these triggers the fancier version of the 